there are two ways of answering the question. One is by dealing with the question itself. And the other is by providing some more information about the subject so that there is no question. Which, of course, the second way is much better. So, Lamashal, at the Seder, the Chacham has his question, and the Rosha has his question. You can answer it, each one. You can tell the Chacham what he wants to know, you can tell the Rosha what he wants to know. Or, you can look at the Tam <coughs> as being an answer. Because the Tam says, Mazes. That's really an answer to the Chacham. The Chacham wants to know why there are three different kinds of mitzvahs. And the Tam says to him, Mazes. What's a mitzvah? If you knew what a mitzvah was, your question would fall away. The Rosha says, Moho lochem. The Tam says, Mazes. What is Avedah? If you knew what Aveda meant, you wouldn't have your question. <coughs> so the, the Tam is really the wise son. The Chacham is the smart son. But smart isn't always wise. You can have a very smart kid, but a very immature kid. There's no wisdom. So the Tam is really the most mature. So if you use that model... When you have a question, obviously, the question is the result of some missing information. You provide that missing information, the question stops being a question. <coughs> like if your question is, what's that banging? There's a shoe store, a shoe repair guy, who has a store right up there. Does that answer your question? He's a shoe man. He's fixing shoes. So what we want to do is not answer questions. Because that, that can go on forever. This question, that question, another question, another question. The real way of learning is Get the information you need so that there are no questions. It's very easy to get used to certain words, to language. And once you get used to the words, you forget what they mean. Because it doesn't matter anymore. So the muscle, how many spheres are there? How many categories do they break down into? Two. Two categories. Seho. What's the first of the middays? Chesed. What's the first of the Seho? We know all that. We even know that in Chesed there's also Gvura. Gvura Shebbe Chesed. So we know a lot of stuff about the spheres. But if I were to ask you a very simple question, what's a svira? What's a svira? You can't tell me a svira is chesed. That's just the name of one of the svidas. But what's a svira? The cloth kasha. Mazes. What's a svira? There are ten of them. Fine. What is it? The whole problem with understanding the world that scientists will never solve is the ultimate question, how does nothing become something? They'll never figure it out. The only answer to that question is in Chassidus. What does Chassidus say? How do you go from nothing to something? What's the answer? (coughs) 
Mm-hmm. How does he do it? <laughs> That's his problem. What do I care? It's what he gets paid for. It's what he does. So part of the answer is yesh me'ayim. To go from nothing to something is is not uh, not explainable. One minute there's nothing, the next minute there's something. How did that happen? Don't know. <coughs> not I don't know. Can't know. You can't know. Because we don't understand what nothing means. So we don't know how nothing can become something. But once something started to exist, everything else makes sense. Because after the Yeshma'ayin, what follows after Yeshma'ayin? Ilova Ova. A sensible, logical, step by step development. That's called Seder Hishtalshalas. Seder Hishtalshalas means an intelligent system where one thing leads to another. So let's start with Chachma. Once you have Chachma, Bina follows naturally. And from that, Das has to come. And from Das, there has to be Chesed and Gvura. And from Chesed and Gvura, there has to be Netzach and Hayd. It's all logical. Understandable, explainable, and necessary. So what is a Svidim? A svira means an appearance. First, there's nothing to see. It's ayin. Then something appears. It becomes visible. That's called a svira. Ten things become visible in each world. Those are the ten sviras. So every svira means a gilu. Something was revealed. Something became visible. Chachma is a visible form of godliness. Bina is another visible form of godliness. And so on and so forth. When we go down the list of svidas, we're basically saying, how did the Eibishter connect to his world? Because if there's no connection, then we, be, then we can't be connected to him. That's why he created the world with a chain. One link connects to the other link. Coming down, that's why we can follow the chain back up and connect to him. So each svira is like another layer. You have, for example, a, a diamond that's very clear, bright, and you put a coat of paint on it. Then you put a second coat of paint on it, and then a third coat of paint on it. Eventually, it doesn't look like a diamond at all. But it is. It's a diamond with ten coats of paint on it. And instead of being white and clear, it's now dark, black. If you want to get back to the diamond, what do you do? You peel away one level of, one layer of paint, then you peel away another layer of paint, then you peel another layer until you get back to the original. That's what Avedas Hashem is. The Ebrish that created the world by putting more and more layers on himself, we have to remove one layer after another until we get back to him. Now what are these layers? In the beginning, there's only the Eivishter. 
then suddenly a creation <coughs> comes into existence, like Atsilus. In Atsilus, everything is aware of the Abishta, because there are no layers yet. Layer means, what about me? That's a layer. What about me? And that can get very heavy. You can say, for example, I understand what Taylor is saying, but what about my opinion? Then you can say, not only do I have an opinion, I also have a feeling. I don't like not only do I have a feeling, I have a need. Not only do I have a need, I have a habit. I don't want to break my habit. Not only do I have a habit, I have <coughs> friends. And they don't do this, so I can't do it either. Each one of them is another l layer of paint on the original reality. So what does it mean to get back to the Ebushta? Well, first of all, you have to peel away. Whether your friends are doing it or not, you have to do what you have to do. Second layer, no matter how hap habitual, no matter how long you've been in a habit of doing things a certain <clears throat> way, you have to break your habit. That's peeling away another layer. A third layer, no matter how strongly you feel about something, you have to put your feelings aside and do what you got to do. Then there's another layer, and that is you have to peel away your opinion. It, it, you don't understand it, and it doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't matter. That's the way it is, so you, go, you do it. In other words, you're getting back to the original reality. The original reality is you didn't exist. You didn't exist. That's the difference between a chosid and a misnagi. A misnagid begins, I'm here. Now, what do you want from me? You want me to keep Shabbos? Okay. You want me to keep kosher? All right. You want me to love every Jew? Okay. That's asking too much. You want me to fast one day, Yom Kippur? Okay. Two days? No. I can't, I can't fast two days. In other words, I'm the reality. You want me to change, it depends on me. If I can, I will. If I'm in the mood, I'll do it. If I like it, yes. If not, not for me. A chosid thinks a little differently. The chosid thinks, first there's an Ebeshte, and I don't exist. Now all of a sudden I do exist. What for? So my question is, what did the Abish they create me for? Because I didn't exist. He did. So what am I here for? I'm here to keep Shabbos, fine. I'm here to keep kosher, fine. That's what I'm here for. So I don't have an opinion. I don't judge it by, do I like it? Do I feel like it? Do I, am I in the mood? I'm not, I'm not the one that sets the agenda. Why can't you? You can, but it doesn't make sense. Why not? Because he was here first. It's like if you come into somebody else's house, you do what he wants. You don't treat it as if it's your house. So if you think it's your house, then you tell the Abish there what you're willing to do for him. But if it's his house, then whatever he wants, that's, it's his house. That, that's just very simple. That's if you look at it as a house. Okay, you look at it as a world. <laughs> it's his world, not my so world. Say it's not his. How can you say it's not his? How can you say it is his? So it boils down to this Whose world is it? His or mine? Now, I don't know why it's his. 
but I know for sure it's not mine. <laughs> because I wasn't even around when it all started. So it can't be mine. That, that's the beginning of being a chassid. <coughs> you can say it in very chassidish words and very fancy language, but in simple language, it's not my world. If I get that into my head, everything else becomes easy. Not my world. Why does the Abish have to have... <laughs> it's, not, it's not a problem. For whatever reason. It's his world. It's his, it's his plan. It's his house. I'm his guest. So he doesn't want me to eat that. I don't eat it. It's his... <clears throat> doesn't want me to work on Shabbos it's his world I don't touch it if he doesn't want me to touch it so Lamashal I don't know if you've ever paid attention if you rent an apartment you ever rent an apartment you rent an apartment the landlord tells you you may not put tape on the walls because when you take the tape off it takes the paint off no tape on the walls. You can't hang pictures except in certain places because I don't want holes all over the walls. I don't want a dog in the apartment because dogs make a mess. I don't want you to uh, play music loud at night because the neighbors don't like it. He gives you a whole set of rules. And you don't say, don't tell me what to do in my apartment. Why don't you say that? Because it's, <laughs> it's his. If it's his, wait, well, you can make a wall, a, a hole in his wall. Now you can say, now, why does it, why does it bother him to have a little hole in the wall? What's so terrible? I don't know. He's a Michigan, okay? But it's his wall. If he doesn't want a hole in his wall, I have no right just as a decent, logical human being. I have no right to make holes in his wall. And even though I disagree with him, and I think a few holes in a wall make it look better, <coughs> I think it looks good if you have a couple of holes in a wall. He doesn't. He doesn't think so. And since it's his wall, so my opinion really doesn't count. So I can call him a Michigan but I can't make holes in his wall. That's the beginning of menschlichkeit. It's the beginning of sanity. And it's the beginning of happiness. When a person thinks it's his apartment and he can't make a hole in the wall when he wants to, it makes him miserable. When a person says, it's my life and I can't eat chazer, it's uncomfortable. How did I lose control over my life? It's my life and I can't steal. It's my life and I can't eat on Yom Kippur. Something's wrong. It bothers me. It's my life. The very simple reality is it's not mine. That, that, that takes all the problems away. It's not mine. Now the question is, if it's not your life, not your apartment, then you can't make holes in the wall. But would you bother making the apartment nicer? It's not, it's not your apartment. Why should you bother? So whatever I can't do, I can't do. Not my apartment. But I'm not going to spend money on it. I'm not going to spend time making it beautiful if it's not mine. What if the guy you're, lent, you're renting from says, if you live in the apartment and you make it nicer and you don't do any damage, then eventually it'll become your apartment. Now you're starting to think, what can I do to make this my apartment? How does it become mine? 
So the landlord tells you, if you don't make damage and you do this and this and you take good care of the apartment, eventually you'll become my partner and it'll be half yours. And it makes sense. I would want to make the apartment nicer. But what does nicer mean? I can't just make up my own mind. Nicer improvements has to be the kind of improvement that the landlord likes. Because if he doesn't like it, it's not going to work. That's what mitzvahs ase and mitzvahs leisese are. Mitzvahs leisese is, it's not your wall, you can't make holes. Mitzvahs ase, if you do the improvements to the apartment that the landlord likes, eventually you become a partner in the land. That's what a chilek and olam habo means. Chilek and olam habo means that in Olam Habo, when the time comes, you will have a chilek. It'll be partly your world. Why? Because you fixed it up. Because you made a difference. You became a partner. Now this world belongs to you. It's called a chilek and Olam Habo. This makes sense? The problem is, there's a Yetzirah. What is a Yetzirah, by the way? Mazis. What's a Yetzirah? You have a Yetzirah? Yeah. Yeah, you do. If you have one, you should be able to explain what it is. What is a Yetzirah? Something that causes you to do bad. How does it cause you to do bad? How does it work? What is it? Huh? It puts thoughts in your mind. It puts bad thoughts. bad thoughts. What are bad thoughts? Desires. Huh? Desires. You can say Tivus. You can say Gaivas. You can say jealousy, laziness. These are all bad thoughts. But they're all coming from one place. Where are they all coming from? From a Yetzahara. So a Yetzahara is just a collection of bad thoughts? What is it? It's a spirit. It's a spirit. Say that in English. <laughs> What's a spirit? See, there's a, there's, it's so important. Goyim don't know that there's a Yetzirah, and that's why they're, they're helpless, they're clueless. We happen to know that there's a Yetzirah and a Nefesh Abraham. <coughs> What's the difference? No. Yetzirah and a Nefesh Abraham. What's the difference? Misnagdim don't know that there's a Nefesh Bahamas. They think there's a Yetzah Tev and a Yetzah Hara, and that's it. And that's pathetic. Let me show you the difference. <coughs> Nefesh Bahamas means I enjoy, I get pleasure from the things that I need. That's called a Nefesh Bahamas. I don't just eat. I love eating. I don't just sleep. I enjoy sleeping. <coughs> I don't just exercise. I enjoy exercise. That's Nefesh Abahamas. Yetzirah means I have enjoyment from things I don't need. The Yetzirah is not interested in anything you need. The Yetzirah only wants things you don't need. So, Lamosh, you want to eat breakfast? What is that? 
Nefesh Abamis. You want a daf to eat a non kosher breakfast? That's your Yetzirah. Why? What, you need non kosher. You don't need it. You need food. It has to be non kosher. That's a Yetzirah. A person needs to be married and to have a relationship and to have children. That's a Nefesh Abamis. A person, Dafke, wants to have relations with somebody who's not his wife. What is that? That's Yetzirah. Why? Why is it Yetzirah? Because you don't need it. You want to you eat another ice cream. The first one is Nefesh Bahamas. The second one is Yetzirah. Well, maybe you just enjoy the ice cream. Yeah? Yeah, but you don't need it. That's the point. There are certain pleasures that come from things you don't need. That's the eight sahara. The first ice cream did? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you were hot, you were thirsty, whatever. You need a little bit. So the Nefesh Abahamis wants to enjoy its needs. The eight sahara wants what it doesn't need. That's when you say, say What do you mean by that? You say you want to do something, you're going to, and people say, it's just a Yetzirah. What does that mean? How do you know it's the Yetzirah? Because if it's something there is no need for, then it's a Yetzirah. So potato chips is always Yetzirah. Because you never need potato chips. There's another thing. If it's a nefesh a Bahamis, <coughs> if it's a nefesh a Bahamis, then once you've had enough, your nefesh a Bahamis is satisfied. You're hungry, you want to eat breakfast. You ate breakfast, nefesh a Bahamis is happy. But if you want potato chips, and you have potato chips, are you happy? Never, because you need more <coughs> potato chips. You never have enough. Why is there never enough potato chips? Because you don't need it. If you're eating it only because it's enjoyable and you don't need it, when do you stop wanting to enjoy it? It's endless. It has no tachos. So you'll never have enough of a yetzahar. That's why... If you kill your Yetzirah, whatever that means, I don't know how to do that. If you kill your Yetzirah, fine, you're not missing anything. If you kill your Nefesh Bahamis, you're going to be a very sick person. So a Nefesh Bahamis, you're not allowed to kill. Ozeif, Tazeif, Iman. You have to work with your Nefesh Bahamis because your Nefesh Bahamis wants what's necessary. A nefesh, uh, a yetzahara, wants what isn't necessary, so it's not necessary. So if you could kill your yetzahara, you wouldn't be missing anything. So what does it mean that a tzaddik doesn't have a yetzahara? It's making sense? What does it mean a tzaddik doesn't have a yetzahara? You know, so what's the difference? A tzaddik does not enjoy something he doesn't need. In some way, we should all be tzaddikim. Somebody comes to you and says, uh, <laughs> how would you like to buy an elephant? Well, what would you say? You say, what, what am I going to do with an elephant? So you have no Yetzirah for an elephant. Why? Because you don't need. Because you don't need it. Like, what do you want me with an elephant? Somebody comes to you and says, "You have a girlfriend." A what? Come on, don't tell me that you don't have a Yetzirah. I have a Yetzirah, but it's got to make sense. What do I need a girlfriend for? For what? I don't need. I don't need. Leave me alone. 
So to some degree, we all are tzaddikim in certain areas. This guy said to me, Abba, he said, I, I'm, I'm fed up with Yiddish. It's not for me. I, I, I quit. It's not for me. I said, don't, don't be ridiculous. He said, it's not ridiculous. Not everybody's, met, not everybody's cut out to be from. I said, no, but you're, you're sounding ridiculous. He says, why? I said, this statement, Yiddishkeit is not for me. You want to marry a guy? I said, I want to marry a guy. Oh, so that's, that is for You want to eat chazer? No, not necessarily. Oh, so that's also. So don't make a statement, Yiddishkeit is not for me. Makes sense. So even if you stop being from, there's still things you don't need. You're not interested. I don't need it. In that, in that area, you don't have a Yetzirah. And that's why Amich Kulam Tzadikim. In some way, we are all Tzadikim. Because in many things, we really don't need it. We know that we don't need it. So we're not interested. That's called not having a Yetzirah. <coughs> so what is a Yetzirah? A Yetzirah means I don't need it, but I want it. I don't need it, but I enjoy it. In fact, if I did need it, I wouldn't enjoy it so much. So when you come to somebody who has a Yetzirah, and you say, what do you need these video games for? What do you need it for? You're not giving him a good argument. He wants it because he doesn't need it. That's a Yetzirah. So you can tell him from today until tomorrow, you don't need it. That's right. <laughs> that's what a Yetzirah is. I don't need it, and that's why I want it. You say, oh, but you don't need it. You say, You're not communicating. Of course I don't need it. A Yetzirah never needs. It just wants. A Nefesh Bahamis needs. So, when you say to somebody who never learned anything, is not through him, doesn't know anything, and you say to him, don't listen to your Yetzirah, are you asking him to become through him, or are you just telling him to be normal? Whether you're from or not, why are you listening to a Yetzirah? You don't need it. It's just a Yetzirah. That makes sense? But you can't say it's just a nefesh of Bahamas. What do you mean, just? How can you tell the difference? Two things. One is, is it a is it a need? Number two, can you satisfy it? The nefesh of Bahamas, once it has had a meal, is not hungry anymore. Nefesh of Bahamas, you get married, you have a wife, you don't need any more. Yetzirah, so what if I have a wife? I need other things too. So you have to have an affair also. You have to have a girlfriend on the side. You have to cheat once in a while. You have to? Of course you don't have to. <coughs> That's a Yetzirah. You finished eating already. Now, now what do you want? Now, now I want more potato chips. But you don't need it. Uh, exactly. That's exactly right. I don't need it. That's why it's so much fun. In other words, the Yetzirah doesn't like when things get real. That's why people would rather talk to each other online than, than face-to-face. Because face-to-face is real. The Yetzirah doesn't like real. It likes make-believe. It likes to stay away from things that are real. So you go to a movie. What's the movie? It's a silly story. It's a Baba Mice. Uh huh. <laughs> That's exactly. People say, no, go only to serious movies that teach you something. Nobody wants to go to those movies. If you go to a movie, you want to go to the stupidest movie possible that makes absolutely no sense. It's totally fantasy. That's a machaya. 
Huh? That's pure entertainment. Pure entertainment means away from reality. Like a drug. Huh? It's like a drug. Yeah. Real life is boring. Let's make believe. So, we've touched on two subjects. What is a Yetzirah? And what is a Svira? If you make a habit of learning in this style, what is that? What are you talking about? Tell me what it is. You come away with some very important knowledge. If you just use words that you're used to, it's a hard enough Shabbat What's the difference? I don't know. They're both bad. This is not learning. It's not useful. Then when you have a real problem, you don't even know that you have the answer. Because the information you have is not real. It's not translated into sensible, reasonable, practical information. What's a svira? A svira means when something becomes less and less me because there are more and more layers on it. What does it have to do with life? When you were a kid, whatever your father and mother wanted, that's what happened. Your father said, we're going to the store. You went to the store. Your father said, we're going home. You went home. There were no layers. He was the father, and that's all there was to it. Then suddenly some layers started to develop. Why do we have to go home now? I don't want to go home now. In other words, something besides the father started to become, started to develop. Eventually, you not only have a different, um, a different desire, your father wants to go home, you don't want to go home. Eventually, you start having different opinions. You start having an opinion about your father. He's a good father. He's not a good father. He knows what he's doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's a success. He's a failure. You have an opinion. In other words, more and more layers are developing to where you are becoming more you and less him. Just like when the world was created, the world became more and more a world and less Abishta. This is called klipa. Klipa means I am my father's son, but I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I'm his son. I don't want to be his son. The reality is that what's important to him is important to me, but I don't feel that. I don't think that. I disagree with what's important to him. That's called klipa. Because deep down inside, I am still his son, and what he wants is important to me. And if he's disappointed in me, it really bothers me, but I don't feel it. I don't care. That's called a klipa. So klipa means a layer on reality. That's why people go to therapy. When they have problems, they go to therapy. And what does the therapist discover? Know anything about psychology? Uh huh. They make up problems. <laughs> Eventually, the psychologist shows you that you're very upset that your father doesn't like you. And you say, No, I don't care. And he says, Oh, yes, you care. But you're hiding it under layers, which means under clippers. A clipper is a layer. 
So all of psychology basically means you don't know how upset you are about something. And that's why you're acting crazy. Because you are upset, you don't know about what, so nothing is working. You don't like your friends. Why? Because you're angry with your father. That's why you can't make friends? Because you don't know you're angry with your father, so you think you're angry with your friends. So you go and pay this guy $200 an hour, and what does he tell you? He tells you who you're angry at. Or who's angry at you. I tell the story. I tell the story that I experienced it many years ago when we started Beis Chana. We started Beis Chana for women without checking, without any, without any restrictions. We said we had this big Chabad house with 30 rooms and we invited women to come and spend the summer. And whoever came, we accepted. We didn't... We were very naive. And for a number of, of years, it was okay. Everything was fine. Until I think it was the third or fourth year of Beis Chana, one of the women who was there tried to kill herself in the Chabad house. Then we realized that we're being very irresponsible. We don't know who's coming, normal people, crazy people. And what's our responsibility? Can we be sued? We got really... Serious reality check. Anyway, this girl, I mean, she wasn't, she was in her 20s, and um, she had become a little bit more frum while she was there. We didn't know what to do. I mean, we, we caught her just in time to save her life. We didn't know what to do. So we called. 770, to ask the Rebbe, what should we do? If we send her home, she's going home to non from parents. But to keep her, the Rebbe's answer was, Shaykh l'hayreha. It's Shaykh to her parents. So we thought that meant sent her home. She was in the hospital. I go to the hospital. I say, um, I think it's time for you to go home. After you get out of the hospital, she says, I can't go home. Can't go home. She was an alcoholic. She came to Beis Chana <coughs> determined to stop drinking. For two weeks, she didn't drink, and then she couldn't. She went out and got herself drunk. That's when she came back and tried to kill herself, because she failed. She says, my father doesn't know I'm drunk, that I'm, that I'm an alcoholic. She, he thinks that I'm the angel in the family. I'm his only nachas. He went through the war. He's an old man. If he finds out that I, that I drink, it'll kill him. He'll die. I can't, I can't go home. So, of course, we thought, you know, exaggerating, you know, he's going to die. You know. So we called the shliach, where she lives. And we said to him, do you know uh, this family? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, the girl says that uh, she can't go home because uh, the father's going to die from shock. Can you go and tell him that his daughter is an alcoholic and that we're sending her home. The shliach said, I, I, I cannot do that because she's right. The man is going to die from shock. So, Whoa, this is serious. So we called 770. Here's how it worked. <coughs> Rabbi Kharikov would answer the phone. <coughs> But every now and then, for certain things, the Rebbe would pick up the extension and he would speak to Rabbi Chadikov. The Rebbe never spoke to, to the caller. 
he would speak to him. And of course, the caller could hear the Rebbe's voice speaking to Rabbi Chadakov. So we call up, we're talking to Rabbi Chadakov. We said, listen, the Rebbe said to send her home. We can't send her home. Her father will die from shock. He's a frail old man. He went through Tzadus all his life. We can't do it. We hear the Rebbe saying to Rabbi Chadakov, eight years she's been drinking, eight years, and the father doesn't know? So Rabbi Chadakov says, let me ask you something. How could it be that for eight years she's drinking and the father doesn't know? Because like, he's like, <laughs> the Rebbe's like, so we spoke to Rabbi Chadakov, and we said, well, she wasn't at home, and she, she, she avoided, and she <coughs> The Rebbe says to Rabbi Chalikov, but eight years and the father doesn't know? So Rabbi Chalikov says, but still, how can it be that for eight years and the father doesn't know? That was it. End of conversation. So we thought, okay, the Rebbe is insisting that she has to go home. So I go back to the hospital. She was in the middle of an AA meeting. I waited till it was over. The doctor came out, and uh, she came out. I said, here's a dime. A phone call cost a dime in those days. I said, here's a dime. Go call your father and tell him you're coming home. Because the Rebbe said that's it. She goes to the telephone, and I'm standing and talking to the psychiatrist. Ten minutes later, she comes back, and she is shining. She's shining. And she says, he knew. He knew. She called her father, said, you know, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but since I'm 14, I've been getting drunk. The father said, I know, I know, but I don't know what to do about it. So she came back so excited. He knew. He said... If the rabbis over there in Minnesota are willing to, to help you and to take care of you, I'll send the money, stay there, and, and get well. So that's what she did. The psychiatrist, she walked away. The psychiatrist said to me, she's cured. She is cured. She came back so happy because her father did know. So now we understood the Rebbe was saying, eight years a girl is drunk and her father doesn't know. He wasn't saying, how can he not know? The Rebbe was saying, isn't that the problem? Wouldn't you also be an alcoholic if you thought that your father doesn't know what you do all day since you're 14? Wouldn't that drive you to drink? When she found out that he does know, it was such a relief. So she does have a father, and he does know, and he cares. She was cured. Then we realized, when the Rebbe said, he didn't mean send her home. He meant the problem is with the parents. <coughs> she thinks the parents don't even know. Now here's an interesting psychological one. In the next session that she had with the psychiatrist, she remembered the first time she got drunk. She was 14. She came home. She was at a friend's house, and they all got drunk. And the friend said to her, stay here. Sleep here. Don't go home like this. She said, no, I have to go home. They said, but your parents are going to find out... She said, I got to go home. She went home. She was drunk. She walked in the front door. They had a very big house, rich house. She walks in the front door, and right by the door, there was this big iron umbrella holder with two umbrellas in it. She tripped. She's telling the psychiatrist, I walked in, I tripped over the umbrella stand. It fell in on, this, on the tiles, made a lo loud noise, woke my parents up. I was lying on the floor, 
And my parents came to the top of the steps. And they looked down at me and then turned around and went back to sleep. She says, since then I can't stop drinking. So the psychiatrist said to her, you tripped over the umbrella stand? And she thought about it for a minute and she said, no, I kicked it over. I wanted to wake my parents up. I was scared. I wanted them to know that I got drunk and that they should stop me. And when they went back to sleep without saying anything, it destroyed me. And since then, she's convinced that her father doesn't even know that she drinks. <clears throat> when she found out that he does know, he just, he's an old man. He, he doesn't know what to do about it. That she was cured. So, what is klipa? Klipa means you are a certain way, but you've got so many layers on top of you that you don't even know what you care about, what's bothering you, what's eating you. You pay a psychiatrist to take away the klipa, to take away the layer, so that you are who you are. Why did she have to be drunk for eight years, try to kill herself, go to a psychiatrist, just to discover that she wants her father to know what's happening in her life? And if he doesn't know what's happening in her life, it's killing her. She's all alone in the world and she can't take it. How come she didn't know that herself? Because of Klippa. Klippa covers up the reality, the real you. So what is Edelkeit? Edelkeit means you peel away those clippers. Take away those layers. And what's the result? The result is you are who you are. And that's the only way you can be normal. It's the only way you can be healthy. And it's the only way you can be someone's friend. Because if you have layers and clipper and stuff... They don't even know who you are. You don't know who you are. And that's a problem in Yiddishkeit. You do a mitzvah. Who are you? Who's doing the mitzvah? <clears throat> that's why it's so sad. You learn all the right things, but nobody explains it in a way that it helps you be real, helps you be you. So you run around trying to guess, what am I, who am I, am I good, am I bad? It's torture. And then you come to class and you think, okay, now somebody's going to tell me, and nobody tells you. You come out of the class and you still don't know. It's very upsetting. So what we want to do is we want to get a new habit of really understanding what you're learning and not accepting the words. Oh, that's because of a Yetzirah. Oh, that's a Svira. This Svira is higher than that Svira. Tell me what you're talking about. Explain things to me until I know what I'm, what I'm getting. I appreciate what I'm getting and I can share it with somebody else. The whole idea of shlichus and the whole idea of, um, of, of being a car of people is a Lubavitcher idea. Why? Because from people without Hasidus can't be a car of anybody. They don't know what to tell them. What do you say to a person who's not from doesn't know anything, and you're from. And you see them carrying something on Shabbos. What do you tell them? You tell them that according to the Mishnah, Midr even though this is not really a Rishos Arabim, you're really not allowed to... What are you telling them? Rishos Arabim, the Rabbonon, they know what you're talking about. But what else can an Orthodox Jew say? 
if you know a little bit of chassidus, you can be makar of somebody. Because you have something to say to them. What do you say to somebody who's carrying on Shabbos? Huh? That's what you say? You can't carry? Huh? If you're being a car of somebody, you don't say you're not allowed to carry. You say, come to my house for Shabbos. Find out what Shabbos is. You say to him, a Jew is a neshama, and every neshama wants to do holy things, so let's do holy things. You have something to say. You know something about him that he doesn't know. And he'd be glad to hear it. But if you come to him and you say, this is a Shesarabim, the Rabbonon, and you're not allowed to carry, Dalit Amis, Dalit Amis is about four feet, four and a half feet, eight feet. He doesn't know what you're talking about. You're not telling him anything that he cares to know. So why only Lubavitch does outreach? We're used to because we had something to say. Other people didn't do outreach. They didn't have anything to say. Where did you get our pilpul? So the more we have, the more we can offer. So if you're into this kind of thinking, we'll get together a few times and take a subject and make it make sense until we know what we're talking about and we have something useful. Questions? Any The Rebbe said that this is the last generation of Golis and the first generation of Mashiach. What does that mean? Hasn't a generation gone by already? My three-year-old nephew often wants something. So he goes to his mother. His mother says no. So he goes to his father expecting yes as an answer. Is my nephew doing anything wrong? Why would Hashem make a situation where a parent would be very sick and be in the hospital and make a whatever, situation on the family. What can we learn and gain from this situation? I didn't read that one yet. You know what? Question number one. Why would... Oh, that's the first question. Question number two. Why would Hashem cause someone to have... pain. Physical pain? We are not here by choice as opposed to the landlord. That's exactly true because he's the landlord. (laughs) That's exactly true. That's right. You know, if you don't have an option, then he gets to do whatever he wants. And you still don't have an option. So you can say, well, I'm leaving. Okay. <laughs> so now you're, out, now you're without a house. <clears throat> We're talking about things that I don't need comes from the Eight Sahara. What about smoking? Uh, smoking is a mysterious business because the Rebbe was asked to make an issa and he wouldn't. So there's something about smoking that is a little mysterious. Huh? 
Yeah. So one people say the Rebbe didn't want to make an Isser because the Friedrich Rebbe smoked. How can you make it Usser? Something the Friedrich Rebbe did. But the Rebbe once explained, you can't make an Isser on smoking when the problem is not the smoking, the problem is the poison that they put into the cigarettes. Hmm? Mm. It used to be just clean tobacco. Then they put in tar and they put in nic- more nicotine to make it addictive. Also, once you're addicted for a long time, it may be dangerous to stop. So you're better off smoking than not smoking because for some people, not smoking will kill them. Instead of. But it is certainly something that you don't need today even if once upon a time they needed it okay why would Hashem make a situation where a parent would be very sick and in the hospital and make a bad situation to the family and what can we learn and gain from this situation in some way this whole generation is growing up without parents, even in good families. Somehow, children have become very independent of parents. So the whole nature of family life has changed. Children used to listen to their parents because they had no choice. Not because they had their parents. They just didn't have a choice. If your mother said you can't go, you couldn't go. Today, your mother can say you can't go, you have your own credit card, you know your way around, you get on a bus, you go wherever you train, you go wherever you want. And there's no policeman that stops you and says, excuse me, does your mother know you're here? In the olden days, they used to do that. Now they don't do that. You can hang around the mall all day long, nobody will say anything to you. So this was not possible a few years ago. So in... In the previous generation, it's not that children had more respect for their parents. They just couldn't do anything by themselves. Today, we can do whatever we want. So the relationship has changed. Now, if you have derecheretz for your parents, it's real derecheretz. It's not because you have no choice. Everybody in today's generation will either succeed or fail independent of their parents. You see kids who are so good, they're so on track, they're so right, and their parents are so wrong. <laughs> like, where did they get this from? Not from the parents. And then you have children who are so bad, and the parents are so good, where is this coming from? It has nothing to do with the parents. And then you have children who are very good. And they have parents who are very good. But they're not connected. The children's goodness is not from the parents' goodness. It's two separate things. They just both happen to be good. And this is what the Novi said is going to happen before Mashiach comes. Children will be independent of their parents. So whether you're good or bad, right or wrong, up to you completely. Can't blame parents for anything. So sometimes the parents are out of the picture, even begashmis. They're not functional. They're in a hospital. They can't, they can't do anything. But that doesn't change the children's lives because children have to succeed on their own anyway. Even if your parents are healthy. Even if your parents are good and smart and chassidish, you still have to do it by yourself. If a parent is physically not able, then you have the additional motivation. So what can we learn from this? You can learn that what your parent can't do, you have to make up for. So instead of waiting to get something from your parents you end up doing for your parents. And that's 
that's that's a that's something to be proud of. The Rebbe said this generation is the last generation of is the first generation of Mashiach. What does it mean? Hasn't the generation gone by already? So the question is a good question. What's a generation? It's a good klotz kasha. But you also have to ask, what's Golos? And what's Mashiach? Golos means a world that is not true. A situation that is not true. Nothing is right. Jews belong in Eretz Yisrael, and Jews are not in Eretz Yisrael. Non-Jews should be supporting Jews and being Jewish. They're not supporting us. Nothing is right in Golos. <coughs> Mashiach means when the world starts being normal. Of course, it'll take Mashiach to make it completely normal. But even before Mashiach comes, you have to start switching from a crazy Golos world to a more normal Mashiach world. Is the world a little more normal today? Is Moshiach happening? In a few ways, the world is becoming more normal. Number one, communism is finished. It's a big, a big accomplishment. Communism was a completely fake world. It was a total lie. A couple of people took control over the whole country, made themselves very powerful and rich, and convinced the people that they're doing it to make the people happier. It was just a, the biggest lie in the world. And for 70 years, people believed it. Finally, it collapsed, because it's a lie. <coughs> when lies start collapsing, that means Mashiach is coming. When the world can't bluff anymore, that means Mashiach is coming. The world is getting ready for Mashiach. The good thing that's happening in the world today is that you can't bluff. Bad is bad and everybody knows it. You can be a priest with the black, you know, with the whole thing, and you're holy and they call you father. If you don't behave yourself, nobody is going to accept it. You're a pervert, and that's all. In the olden days, you were afraid to say that. <coughs> he's a priest. He can't be wrong. Today, he's wrong. He's an animal. He's a, per he's a pervert. Throw him out. There's no holy sins anymore. You know? A sin is a sin. It doesn't matter who does it. So a government can't say, this is the government's policy. If it's a bad policy, nobody's going to put up with it. Like just recently, in five different countries, by the Arabs, they, they made a revolution and got rid of the dictator. Not that they're any better. But this thing, I'm the dictator, you have to listen to me? No more. No more. You're not doing a good job, we'll throw you out. Who's going to do a better job? It's a good question. But if we don't like what you're doing, we're going to throw you out. There's no more hiding your evil behind some kind of a policy, or which is a very big step towards it. So one of the things that ever pointed to as a sign of Mashiach was the collapse of communism. Nobody beat them up. Nobody invaded Russia. The Russians themselves just said, Okay, okay, so, all right, we're lying. <laughs> That's it, it was over. Only, only Mashiach <coughs> can cause that to happen. When the truth starts popping up, that's a sign that Mashiach is here. <clears throat> we still have a long way to go. Because, okay, now we know that evil is evil. Now what do we do? Now it's all out in the open. Okay, it's a big improvement. Now what do we do? 
Now people are not even ashamed to say, yes, I'm evil, but I have all the money, so too bad. They're not ashamed to say it. I'm the president, I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't care if I'm wrong. I'm the president. I... <laughs> it's better, but it's still not. So we still need Mashiach to come so that those people who are no longer ashamed to be bad should want to become good. And that's going to happen because of what we're doing. It's not going to happen by itself. <coughs> the more we do the right thing, the more we model for the rest of the world how you're supposed to live and how you're supposed to serve the Ebershter, the sooner the evil people are going to become good. And that's what Mashiach is. Bad becomes good. Why would Hashem cause someone to have physical pain? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know if there's any explanation that would be acceptable, convincing. The question is, there is physical pain. What do you do about it? What do you do about it? Some people become less of a mensch because of it. Some people become more of a mensch. So it's just one of the challenges in life. You do a good job or you don't do a good job. But it certainly doesn't help to say, I'm angry at Abish that he's causing all the pain. Right. Now what are you going to do? Now I'm not going to believe in him anymore. Okay, now what are you going to do? Somebody said, you're religious? I said, yeah. He says, you believe in God? I said, yeah. He said, well then why was there a holocaust? I said, okay. I don't believe in God anymore. Now why was there a holocaust? <laughs> what, what, did you solve the problem? As long as there's no Abish that there can be a holocaust. What did you fix? You so you're... It's just something that happened. Yeah? You could say it's just something that happened that couldn't be stopped. If, there, if you said there's a God, then God could have stopped it. But if there's yeah. no God, then there's no way to stop it. Right. No so which is more depressing? <laughs> uh, that there's no God. Of course. If you said there's a God out there, something that could have stopped it, it's still going to happen. That's more depressing than saying there's no God. No. No, if you say there's a God, you have a big question. Why didn't he stop it? If there's no God, then there is no stopping it. You might as well just quit now. Let me ask a different question. Why was there only one Holocaust? Only one guy wanted to kill Jews? He couldn't kill anybody. <clears throat> Since Pari. It's been a long time. So instead of asking why was there a Holocaust, we should ask, how come there was only one? The answer is, because the Abishta didn't allow more than one. But if there is no Abishta, oh well, yeah, we're in trouble. Then there can be ten. God forbid. My three-year-old often wants something. He goes to his mother. His mother says no. He goes to his father. Is my nephew doing anything wrong? Well, first of all, he's doing something very smart. He's manipulating his parents. He's three years old. You've got to watch that kid. He's dangerous. <laughs> he's already manipulating his parents. Is it wrong? Of course it's wrong. But a three-year-old can't really have complaints to a three-year-old. Why is it wrong? Because he's using his parents against each other. If he keeps it up, this is going to be a very unhappy family. You said yes, I told him no. <laughs> uh, smoking, yeah. Um, yeah. We are not here by choice, as opposed to the landlord. There are people who say to their mother, I don't owe you anything, 
because I was not consulted. I didn't ask to be born. You didn't give me a choice. Now, first of all, are you assuming that if you had been asked, you would have said no? Do you know that? <clears throat> Secondly, it's so dishonest to say, I didn't ask to be born. You mean you're not glad to be alive? It's not honest. You're very happy to be alive. So say thank you. There are certain th some things in life you would like to change, yes. But not to be alive? You don't want that. So the fact that you're alive is something you should say thank you for. And the other things in life you can complain about. It. But don't make it sound like you're getting nothing. And the best story for that is there was this couple who were married for many years and they were very happy. It turns out she was the ugliest person you've ever seen. But the husband didn't care because he was totally blind. And he was the most vicious, cursing, putting her down. She didn't care because she was deaf. <laughs> so they lived very happily together. A doctor came to town who could cure everything. So they went. And he made her uh, hear and made him see. A week later, he comes to the house to collect his pay. He wants to get paid. They attack him. <laughs> we should pay you? We were so happy before you came. You made our lives miserable. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to make your life miserable. Come back to the hospital, and I'll undo the operation. They said, eh... <laughs> We don't want to do that. He said, then pay me. <laughs> the fact that your wife turned out ugly, not my fault. <laughs> the fact that you can't stand your husband cursing. But you do want to see, and you do want to hear. So pay me. So if a person says, I didn't ask to be born. Okay. Sorry. Let's undo it. <laughs> So, well, let's not go that far. <laughs> so in that case, say thank you. So the fact that we didn't have a choice bothers a person. How come you didn't ask me? Because sometimes you're not smart enough to know what's best. Is that possible? I'll tell you one more story, which is really... I was someplace in South America, I think Argentina, maybe Brazil. When I arrived, the whole community was in shock because this one, this one boy, 19 years old, was driving back from the country to come in for slichas. And he got into a car accident and he, and he got killed. So the whole community was like in shock. But the boy's mother wouldn't leave the house. She was, she was completely traumatized and wouldn't talk to anybody. And people were very worried about her. So that night when I was speaking, they, they, they almost forced her to come to the program. So she was sitting in the audience. As soon as I finished speaking, they brought her over to me. And they said, this is the mother of the boy. Talk to her. What am I going to say to her? It was, it was so uncomfortable. It was like... So I started asking her about her son. And she says, he was so good. He was so special. He was always kind. He always worried about other people. He was coming in for slichas. And he, and he gets into a car accident and dies. So I said, you're upset because you only had him for 19 years. What if 
God had come to you at the beginning and would have said to you, there is this boy who needs to be born. He needs a mother. But he's only going to live for 19 years. Would, would you agree to be his mother? If they wish to ask you up front, no surprises. He's only going to live for 19 years. For whatever reason. But I need someone to be his mother for 19 years. Would you have said no? I was sure she would say that if Davish had told her up front, she would, have, she would have agreed. But she was so upset, she said, absolutely not. I would never agree to have a son for 19 years, no matter how special he is, and then lose him. So I don't know where this idea came from. I said to her, I said, in that case, it's a good thing that Ibrishta didn't ask you. Because you would have given him a stupid answer. And you wouldn't have had your son for 19 years. And that, like, changed her completely. You can't complain about death if you don't think life is wonderful. Doesn't that make sense? If you don't think having someone for 19 years is wonderful, then you can't complain that you haven't had him for 22 years. If 19 years means nothing, so what's another 19 years? The reason you're upset that you don't have him for another 19 years is because the first 19 years were so good. So if the Ebishter would come to us and say, I need you to be born... I need you to do certain things. I need you to accomplish something. And it's going to hurt. Would you say no? And if you would say no, then it's a good thing Debrishta doesn't ask you because then you would have made a bad choice. So Debrishta doesn't ask us because what we need to do is much more important than our opinion. So the fact that we don't have a choice only makes it more important, not less important. When it's not so important, you ask people. You want to go, you don't want to go. Maybe, maybe not. But when something is important, there is no possibility of no. <clears throat> so a person who's upset because I wasn't asked, you're only asked about silly things. Important things, you're never asked. Because they're too important. There can't, there's no possibility of no. It has to happen. Make sense? So, if you're interested, if you believe in really knowing what you're learning, if you want to understand what you already know, so that it becomes useful information, then we'll have this program and this project for a couple, couple of sessions. And we'll start to make sense of what we're doing here and what we're learning and what we're gaining. You're interested? Yes. yes.